in line. Here I go. The charisma, the character, the spirit of John the Baptist. This is what I want to look at. In John chapter 3, verses 22 is where we'll begin. <clears throat> it says, After these things came Jesus and His disciples into the land of Judea, and there He tarried with them and baptized, and John also was baptizing in Anan near Salem. Because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. And then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. I mean, you've got to watch out between some of these questionings. And then they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he, was, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness, uh, bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And this my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all, and he that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. And he that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, and that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that receiveth his testimony hath set his, to his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him, and the Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into His hand. And he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son should not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. When I was younger, I used to love model cars. I don't know if all of you little boys or, or, or grown men are like I was when I was growing up. And you probably couldn't tell it because I didn't have model cars in my room very often. And probably because I wasn't very good at putting them together. But, you know, while some women, they love to go to Hobby Lobby and they're looking at all the decorations and these things and they're wondering how they're going to decor decorate the house so nice and pretty. Me, I just love working with my hands. So I go over to the model car section and I would glaze through and look at all the model cars that they have to offer. And, you know, each man has their preference. I don't know if you like the, the Barracudas. I don't know if you like the Mustangs. I don't know if you like the, the old Model A or Model T Fords or whatever. I don't know. But for me, you know, I just like the, the old, old-timey cars. Uh, and so I'd pick one out. And, and, and have you ever put one together? I mean, you pull them out of the box, and as a young boy, I probably like, I don't know, 8, 9, 10 years old, pull them out of the box, and I think it's going to be easy. I think it's going to look exactly like the box. It's going to show me that this, this thing is going to look like. And I pull it out of the box, and next thing I know, I see all these tiny little pieces every which way. And... I pull out the instructions. It looks like they're written in Chinese. You, you throw them out and you give, break out the little pieces. And this thing is not so easy to put together. You put the glue onto the pieces and you put them in and, and you get the tires, you get the steering wheel, all these little intricate pieces and, and, and you try to put it all together so you have something to, dis, to display, something to put upon the shelf, something that you can admire but I tell you, when I got it all together, it looked like something that came out of a junkyard. It didn't look like the box. I mean, you look at it and the wheel's kind of tilted, almost popping off, and the door is kind of tilted and these things. I wasn't very good at it. I didn't say I was very good at it. I just said that I loved doing it. And, uh, but this is, this is the way it is sometimes. We look at a man like John the Baptist and we say, man, if, if, if anybody is a man to model their lives after, it's going to be John the Baptist. Jesus himself said there's, there's no prophet, no man greater than John the Baptist, no man greater born among women 
than John the Baptist. And it makes me, cause me to take attention. And I said, if I want to be great in the Lord's eyes, I've got to have the spirit of John the Baptist. I've got to model my life after his. But sometimes when we get to putting our life together and we get to looking at our lives, man, brother... I feel like I just came out of the junkyard. My wheels are tilted. My, I mean, it's not on hydraulics or anything, but it looks like it. Uh, just sometimes that's how we feel when we put together our lives. But if we want the, John, the spirit of John the Baptist, we, we need to take heed and look to the type of spirit this man had. And so we want to look at him. We want to look at all the bits and all the pieces and all the glue that, that held it together as we go through. So let's take a few moments and look at this man carefully. He was a, a bright and shining light. It doesn't really mention that too much uh, here in the first couple of verses. After these things, Jesus and the disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptized in Anan near Salem. John was always just doing what he always did. When we first take a look at the, the, the life of John the Baptist, we see him introduced in John chapter 1. He says, you know, I'm not the light, but I came to bear witness of the light. You know, it's, it's not about me. I just came to be a, a reflector, a magnifier. I, I, I come to reflect, to, to show you who is the light. To point you to the Christ. That's, that's my life. That's my zeal. That's my passion. This is my whole life. And so when I think of John, I mean, everybody's coming to him. They're flocking by the, the Jordan River just to be baptized of this man. When they hear him preach, I mean, they hear him thunder like John the Baptist and old. And, and man, they're trembling because of the word that he's preaching. They take this man serious and they're coming to the Jordan River. They say, man, we got to get right with God. This is this man. I mean, he may be strange looking. He may have on a, a camel outfit. And some of you girls are like... Now, I don't know if I, I would model him too much. I mean, we got to have some fashion to us. I mean, you say, no wonder he hasn't found a wife yet looking like that. But this man, John the Baptist, was something to behold, and he was a shining light, and he caught people's attention because of what he did. He says, I come to bear witness of the light. Uh, I drive down the road sometimes, and even out here we have some reflectors. You see these reflectors, and this is what John the Baptist was. Just like a light in the sky, it reflected the light of the sun. And when you've seen John the Baptist, it was just something that took place on the inside. He, he had God living on the inside, and he just couldn't contain himself. He reflected that, that, that light. It was just an image that was burned into his spirit. When you've seen Him, I mean, you've seen the holiness of God. You've seen the, the passion and the love of God. When you've seen John the Baptist, I mean, wow. That's what I want. But he had God in his life. There was no denying that. He had Christ burned within his heart. I mean, he didn't go into the, some seminary and learn all the Bible knowledge in the world. He didn't... He didn't go and, and, and sit at some feet of some man. He didn't open up the, the books of any book. He just got alone with the Lord. And it's just that Word. That Word of God. Which just was like a fire within his bones and he just couldn't help but to preach the Word of God. And he was a reflector of the light. And then he, just like the reflector of the light that reflects a light so that others can see it which is what you and I are supposed to do, by the way. We're supposed to reflect the light. But he wasn't only that, but he was a refractor of the light. You know, it's some science here. You think of the magnifying glass. I was thinking when I was putting together the message, some little kids out there with a the little magnifying glass and, and burning the little ants. I mean, that's cruel. Who would do such a thing? But he's magnifying that word. He's magnifying his Lord He's magnifying everything. And so the, the Word of God is just uh, burning into the souls and into the conscience of men. And, and He's just who He is. He's totally consumed by the Word of God. He's totally consumed by His Lord. 
He's totally consumed by His God. And people were noticing. People who looked at John the Baptist, and they look at him and said, This is Elijah. This is that great prophet. Surely he's the Messiah that's to come. Surely he's the Christ because of the way he's preaching. Surely he's the Christ because people were coming unto him. And he says, I'm, I'm not that Christ. The message that he's preaching, he says, Repent. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight the way of the Lord, for He's coming. So He was a reflector of the light, a refractor of the light, and He was a revealer of the true light. He says that everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. It's not easy being the light. He says people don't come to the light because they feel that if they get around you, man, that they'd start noticing their inadequacies. They'll start feeling that I can't be with him as I am with my other friends. And that just those inadequacies, they, they don't like the light because they don't want to change their ways. They don't want to be reproved by the light that's so burned into John the Baptist. But some people say, well, I don't mind being a light. I want to be a light. Well, it's good that you want to be a light, but don't be a Christmas light on a Christmas tree. Don't be flashy. This wasn't John the Baptist. He wasn't a flashy man. He was reflecting an internal light that was deep within his soul. That Word of God. That Word of God. And so, one of the things that makes John a model to us is his spirit of goodness. He lived a simple life, not for self, not for the purposes of God to be fulfilled in his, but only for the purposes of God to be fulfilled in his life. And you can model John when you're driven by a singular purpose of God in your life. You know, we get so distracted by this and so distracted by that. He only had one purpose, and that was to serve the Lord, his God. Can I ask you what drives you? When people look at you, what, what do they see? Do they see that light that's burned with inside of you? Do they see that character of a man who's set on fire by the Lord? Many of us live for self and for pleasure, but I don't see that in John's life. He was not only a shining light, but he was a voice of reason to the troubled mind. You see, John the Baptist, the disciples come unto him. They're looking down the river, and they take notice. John, John is not paying attention. He's just over there doing what he always does. And he's preaching. He's telling people to repent and they're coming to him and he's baptizing them into the Jordan River. But all of his disciples, they turn their attention from off of what John is doing. They look up the river and they see Jesus up there and he's baptizing and they get some sort of envy, some sort of animosity, some, some, some feelings that they shouldn't be experiencing. They're jealous for their master. They're, they're jealous for John the Baptist. They're one that they're to, trying to follow. They said, Rabbi, don't you see the man? The one that you said you bear witness of, don't you see him up there? And all people are going unto him. They're not coming to you anymore. They're going to him. They're being baptized in him. He's, he's taking over your work. He's taking over what you've built your whole life on doing. Don't you see him, John? Aren't you going to do something about it, John? And they're troubled in their heart. They're troubled in their conscience. We've given our whole life to serve you, John. And John, to him, he's not thinking of people following him. He's not thinking of that at all. But it brings some calmness to their troubled mind. He's trying to help them to understand the true purpose of why they're there. So while the disciples are there, and they begin to, to question. It says there arose a question between some of the John's disciples and the Jews about this purifying, about this baptizing. And the Bible says there arose a questioning. It was more than just a question. It was more than just, uh, you know, what's this baptism all about? This, this questioning was just like in Acts chapter 15 verse 2 where there, there arose a great questioning amongst the disciples. You know, 
Should we follow parts of the law of Moses? Should we do this? Should we do that? And then they got this counsel together and they began to realize, they said, how did you get saved? It was by faith alone in Christ Jesus. Well, don't add anything more than that to it. And they settled a dispute. It's the same word that's used in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 4, where it says, where Timothy's instructed to avoid and to flee and not to be involved in all these doting about questions and strifes or words, it's these things. Now when he says there arose a questioning, we got to be careful about what arises in our hearts. Because this is not something that, that's of God. This arising is of this, this carnality of our spirit. This thing needs to be stay in the grave. It needs to be stay, in, stay dead. But those things that are of the spirit, that's what should arise out of us. So John's disciples are being carnal right here, and he's going to correct it with this calmness of mind. He's trying to help them to understand that my disciples, it's not about competition. I'm not here for a comparison. I'm not here to be compared to, to Jesus Christ. There's no way that I can be compared to Him. I'm not here to compete with Christ. I'm on the same team. That's the way a lot of us get sometimes. You know, we're looking for the, 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 the greatest following. Even Moses in the Old Testament, and some of the people were coming and, and, and prophesying. Uh, what is it? Joshua. Joshua comes over to Moses and says, Don't you see these people? They're taking over your craft. They're prophesying. He says, I wish that all men have my spirit. The same thing happened here to John. The same thing happened to Jesus when their disciples are asking, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? The same thing happened with Paul. One person says, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Peter. I'm of Cephas. I'm of this. And Paul says, I'm glad that I baptized none of you. It's not about who is, who is Paul's and who is Peter and who's this. But we're all one in Christ. That's what it's about. And this spirit that you have of competition, this spirit that you have of comparison, the spirit of striving, it needs to go. It needs to go. And so he brings some, some truth unto him. And he begins to speak to him and work with him. He says, uh, I, do not, I do know that the Bible says that when we begin to compare ourselves amongst ourselves that we're not wise. In other words, I'm not the standard and neither are you. I think that's what John is trying to get his disciples to see. I'm not the standard. Christ is. Christ is the standard. So the disciples finally uh, come to John and he tells them, he says, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Boys, you remember the words of Jesus? Well, actually, this is further on in Scripture. And Jesus asked the Pharisees, He says, uh, John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it of heaven? Or was it of men? It's a good question. They knew that it was of heaven. But they were afraid of, uh, of men. They didn't believe. And so they said, I can't say it was of heaven. I can't say it was of men. But they knew the answer. It was a rhetorical question. It was of heaven. And so John's authority was given to heaven. He says, the reason why I baptize is because I've been given this authority of heaven. And the reason why Jesus is doing it, what He's doing, I mean, He's above all. He's the master of all. He's got this authority from heaven. Even Jesus would talk to Pilate and He, he told him, He says, you don't have authority to do anything over to me except for what God has given you the authority to do. That's one thing we got to remember uh, where does this authority come from? In verse 31, he says, He that cometh from above is above all, and he that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. John the Baptist understood there's no comparison. There's no competition. He says, you know, but I think the whole point of John the Baptist is, boys, you should be joining him. You, sh you should go 
be baptized of Christ yourself. Even I have need to be baptized of you. When it came, when Jesus came to be baptized of John, He said, I have need to be baptized of you. That's where His Spirit was. Submissive, humble, as a spirit that you and I need to model of this goodness, of this gentleness that He had about, about Him. I mean, He could have uh, ripped into his, his disciples. He could have rebuked them heavily and all these things, but He didn't do that. He says, let me just give you some truth. He says, I understand what you're saying and you're jealous over me. I understand that you mean for my well-being. But the truth of the matter is, boy, all of us need to join ourselves to Christ. All of us need to join ourselves to Christ. Paul said, some indeed preach Christ of envy and strife, some also of goodwill, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, the other of love, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and I will rejoice. He said, I'm rejoicing in the gospel getting out. I'm rejoicing in people being saved. I'm rejoicing in the work of Christ. He wasn't worried about what was going on. And then he was a spiritual restorer in a manner of meekness. John tells his disciples, he says, Yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I'm sent before Him. And I like how John reminds, uh, just reminds his disciples of the truth. He says it's a, an amazing thing that you've forgotten so quickly what I said. It's amazing that you've overlooked the fact that I said that I wasn't the Christ and that He is the Christ. Let me take you some time and remind you of what our life is all about. It's not about self-promotion. It's not about uh, looking out for ourselves. It's about living for the Lord. So He reminds them of this truth of that he, he was not the Christ. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, Beloved, I now write unto you in both uh, in which I stir up your mind, pure minds by way of remembrance. And John the Baptist says, Fellas, do you remember why we're here? Man, there's, there's nothing good about us. The reason why I'm here, I need to repent just like the rest of you. I had to come to God just like the rest of you. I've called you to repent. I've called you to turn your life unto God. I, I didn't call you unto myself. The purpose, the reason why you're here is for Him. And, and just, just like I need Him, you need Him. I think John not only modeled the goodness as a light set on fire by the Lord and a gentle voice of reason, but also meekness with a firm grasp on the truth. And Christ is said to have the preeminence in our lives. We say that a lot, don't we? Christ must have the preeminence. He must be first. He must be the one and only. But how often is He? Uh, it started out the sermon with the illustration of the model cars and these things. But I remember when I was young, probably 11 or 12, my stepdad, he had me out there helping him. And I, I love getting my hands dirty. I love mechanics and these things. And uh, he was trying to work on his Datsun King Cab truck. I thought it was the best thing in the world, powerful. That was a hunting truck. He took the hood off, and we're sanding it off and, and smoothing it down and all these things. And, and he gives me the sandpaper. I wanted to help him out. I said, how can I help you out? He hands me the piece of sandpaper, and I get to scrubbing. You know how fun that is? I'm probably about 10 minutes of scrubbing. I said, I think it's good. He said, it's still got paint on there, son. Uh, okay. I get to scrub it again. It feels like eternity when you want to do something else. I mean, I want to be involved in all the, the, the glitz and glam. I want to restore the engine, and he has me sanding down the hood of a truck. I said, is that good enough? He takes my hand, puts it on the hood of the car. He says, rub your hand across here. 
I said, yeah. I said, what does that feel like? Well, it's kind of rough a little bit, bits and spots. He said, that thing needs to be smooth. I said, it has to be smooth. Well, don't you have some power equipment or something to work on this thing? Can't somebody else do it? I mean, I just, I wanted to do something entirely different. John the Baptist is sanding out some rough edges in his disciples' life. He says, I have some rough edges in my own life, but I've got to help you. And he wasn't the kind that has a beam in his own eye and trying to pluck splinters out of somebody else's eye. It wasn't that at all. See, only a person who's spiritual can restore such one in the spirit of meekness. And he gives them the truth. He reminds them of the truth. He applies that bondo of the truth and smooths out the hood so they can put the, the paint on there and gloss it over and make it look shiny and bright. That's what it's all about. Remember my, I told you about Brother James Edwards, man, when I first got saved, and he would come in and minister unto us, and he, he would teach Bible studies often. I remember this one illustration that he told me. He said, there was a time where I was a deacon, and I knew some things that were going on to the church. He said, I went into the pastor. He said, I was so upset and so overwhelmed by all these things. I went into the pastor and I began to tell him all about this guy and he put his hand up in my face and he said, stop. He looked at him all confused. He said, what do you mean stop? He said, stop. He said, I don't need to hear about all your problems. I don't need to hear about all this contention you have against the next guy. I don't need to hear about this and that, unless it's something immoral or something that will remove him from, from being here, or church discipline or something like that, stop. You're no better than he is. And stopped him right there in his tracks. He said, I'll never forget that day. I mean, sometimes, I mean, we keep our eyes focused on the next person. We keep our eyes focused on the other person. We try to be better than somebody else. We need to stop, sand out those rough edges. This was a man of John the Baptist. He realized that he wasn't a perfect man. He just wanted to love the Lord. He just wanted to live for the Lord. He was just a voice that cries in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. And the Bible says in the very next verse there, in Isaiah 40, verse 3, it says, and Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Some of us need... 100 grit sandpaper. Others of us need 1,000 grit sandpaper. But nonetheless, God's still working on us all. So he was a humble man who just hasn't arrived yet. And then he was a devout friend of the bridegroom. He looks over and sees the work of Jesus and I see him looking up with a gleam in his eye, just a joy in his heart, smile on his face. I mean, he's, he's spry, he's happy, he's, he's overjoyed and he's excited. He calls himself a friend of the bridegroom. Now, I had to look that up. A friend of the bridegroom, his whole function here is to be a matchmaker. He's, he's wanting to join a, a bride and groom and see a perfect marriage come together and these things. He's a matchmaker is what he is. Uh, over at Ambassador, Sarah and I, you know, we were over at Ambassador. We had two professors. I mean, they, they love being matchmakers. Who are they? Pastor Jay and Pastor Camp. I mean, they they just something else. I mean, the first year they say, man, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be dating and these things. They, they took a, like a year time out. We didn't listen to that rule, did we? Uh, anyway, they they get together and they watch and they observe and, and they say, have you have you seen this girl over here? Have you seen this guy over here? Have you noticed them? Have they caught your eye? Uh, before I, I knew it, Sarah told me, she says, yeah, Pastor Jay brought up your name long before you even knew about it. And, uh, but he was that kind of man. He was just overexcited and overjoyed when he seen the couples come together and he would see the, the little times that they would spend together and, and all these things. And he was just full of life. I mean, it brightened his day. He, he was just enamored by the whole, the whole thing. And we would come together, Sarah and I, we would come together for marriage counseling. And as soon as we come in, I mean, his whole face would just lighten up. He would say, so how was it? How's it going with your relationship? How's it looking for you guys? I said, oh, it's been great. 
I'm, I'm so thrilled that the Lord put us together in these things, and, and He just it brought Him life, and it brought Him joy. And Pastor Camp, after we got married, he kept asking the very first question. He'd always ask, "Are you pregnant yet?" I mean, can can you can you ask something else? <laughs> that gets a little personal there. But they take joy in these things. John says, "You know what brings me joy? You know what brings me love and life and it gives me life." It's when I take and I see all these people and they're coming to hear the Word of God and I'm able to preach unto them and I say, have you considered Jesus? Have you looked at Him? He's, he's wonderful. I mean, He's great. He's grand. There's something special about this man. And He loves you. He loves you with all of His heart. I mean, the best way I can describe Him, He's the lily of the valley. I mean, He's the thing that just brightens up the whole hillside. He's the rose of Sharon. He's, he's just got that sweet fragrance. I mean, this is something that you want in your yard. He's lovely, altogether lovely, and His banner over you is love. I mean, He has such a heart and a desire to, to bring you unto Himself. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords, and of course, if you just join yourselves unto Him, I mean, uh, it doesn't... nothing grandiose? Well, it is because He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. I, I'm, I'm grateful. <laughs> I'm grateful for my salvation. I mean, one day the Bible tells me that I want to rule and reign with Christ and I'm looking forward to the marriage feast. I'm looking forward to that, that future event. I'm looking forward when I'm one day with Christ. Physically. Presently. Not that He's not here now. So we're two or three gathered together. There I am in the midst. But man, our Lord is lovely, is He not? He's great, is He not? I mean, how could you not want to repent? How could you not want to give your life unto the Lord? He says, I'll redeem you out of this world. All the ugly that's in your life, I'll get rid of it. I'll redeem you unto myself. I'll give you the, the purchase. I've shed my own blood for you. That's how much I love you. And I want to seal you with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And you'll be mine forever. And no devils want to have any claim over you. It doesn't get any better than that. He says, I have all the treasures, all the riches of heaven to give you. All you have to do is say, I do. All you have to do is, is say, I will, and come unto Christ. And say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I, I failed you. Lord, I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior of my life. Lord, I want you and nobody else. I count all things but loss that I may win Christ. That was John the Baptist's attitude. He such, took such joy and such love and such pleasure in the, in the fact of what Jesus was doing. He took joy and pleasure in joining people to Christ. He's the friend of the bridegroom. He's preaching the gospel. He's introducing them to Christ, a man who's, who's altogether lovely. And it thrilled his heart and he says, I count all the things my life but loss. My father, he was a priest in the temple. He served the Lord. I count all things but lost that I may win Christ. That's the spirit of this man. He loved the Lord with all of his heart. Loved Him. He was a matchmaker. He was a preparer. He was the wedding organizer. The Bible tells us about uh, some preparation. Paul tells us over in 2 Corinthians, For I'm jealous over you with a godly jealous jealousy for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You know, you and I were being prepared for a great wedding day. He says, I'm preparing you as a chaste virgin to Christ. What he's saying is I want you to be pure in your mind. I want you to be pure in your spirit. I want you to be pure in your life. I'm separating you from the world unto Christ. That's what he's calling us to do. We're living unto Him. We're here for the Lord. And John looks out and sees the baptizing of his friend. He sees that the wishes of both parties are accomplished. I mean, uh, he gets the, the bride. I mean, uh, we get uh, eternal salvation. And, and just, oh, I mean, I can't even begin. If I took time and described to you heaven and what all it entails, we'd be here for a long time. 
but both wishes of both parties are accomplished and, and he's overwhelmed by the feelings of love and joy and peace that is brought to him by serving Christ. He would want you to know, uh, you want to know what made John a great man? It was that he genuinely loved the Lord and he rejoiced in his calling. You know, there's nothing greater in the world than being a pastor. I'm rejoicing in my calling. I don't do it as well as what I ought to. I told Sarah the other day, I was praying. I said, as much as I studied the life of John the Baptist here, and I know so little of it, but as much as I look at this man, I see how far I fall short. And I have to ask the Lord, would you really forgive me of my shortcomings? But I rejoice in the calling that God has given me. I rejoice in the bride. I rejoice in the groom. I rejoice in my Lord. He was fulfilling his role faithfully. How about you? He was a campaigner for Christ. The Bible says, He must increase, but I must decrease. And there was a good godly man in London. His name was F.B. Meyer. And uh, he, he was a great pastor. I mean, from everything that I can tell of him, I mean, people loved him. He was at the peak of his ministry, the pinnacle of his ministry, all people were coming to hear his preaching and these things, and, and, and he was a great man. No doubt about it. Kind, gentle, loving, a uh, pastor that anybody would want. But there, about the same time where he was at the peak of his ministry, a young man comes on the scene, about 19, 20 years old, and begins to preach and steals the hearts of the people. People are leaving his church. If, you know, he begins to think to himself, how dare this young man, he hasn't even grown up in life enough to be able to tell anybody anything. All the people are leaving his church every time that he walks on the street corners, he hears the name of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. They get so tired of him, so, so overwhelmed. And he's like, people don't realize how great of a preacher they got. But he gets down on his knees before the Lord. He says, it's not right that I have these feelings of bitterness. It's not right that I have these feelings of envy. It's not right that I have these feelings of hatred toward this young man. He's out there. He's preaching the gospel. And he says, Lord, I want to tell you what I want to do. I want to start praying for this man. I want to get down on my knees faithfully every day. And I want to pray that the Lord would just give him uh, fruit for his labor, that he would give him souls. That he get a double portion of the Spirit of heaven. I want to pray for him. I pray that his influence goes around the world ten times over and not just once. And he begins to pray for Charles Spurgeon. And F.B. Meyer says it's just like a whole new joy came over his spirit. I mean, when he, every time that he'd hear about the, the success of Charles Spurgeon, he began to rejoice as if it was his own success. This great preaching by this young man, he, he began to, to be overcome by it and take part in that success. I mean, he, he loved Charles Spurgeon. Why? Because... He realized that it wasn't about him. It was about people getting saved. He realized that these feelings were wrong. And sometimes, you know, we can get some, some feelings against What we need to do is we need to get down on our knees and pray for others. Pray for those who offend us. Pray for those who do wrong to us. Pray for... Esteem others better than ourselves need to pray for our brother. we need got a lot of praying to do, don't we? But this man, he learned that same lesson that John the Baptist is talking about here. He says, uh, he must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. It's okay if, if he steals my glory. It's not my glory to begin with. It's Christ's glory. He said, I didn't come to, to be center stage. I didn't come to get all the attention. I didn't come for the limelight. I'm just a spotlight pointing people to Christ. I didn't come to, uh, to be the main attraction, the soul. As I came to play second fiddle to the Master. This is what we ought to do. You know, some, a lot of times we want to take center stage. We want to be the one controlling the conversation. We want to be the one to, that everybody pays attention to. 
We just got to keep that focus centered on Christ. We need to esteem others better than ourselves. And then John the Baptist was an anchor of the faith. Lastly, John held firm to the faith from what I can see here in the Scriptures. It says, He that cometh from above is above all, and he that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. And he that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testified, and no man received his testimony. And he that hath received his testimony has set this seal, that God is true. He just, what he said there, in verse 33, he said to his seal, so I'll put my mark on this paper. I'll, I'll sign whatever you want me to say. This is my confession that He's the Christ. He's the one that must increase. He's the one that, that I want to hold to. He's the anchor of my soul. He's, he's the fairest of 10,000. He's my everything. I set my seal upon it. And we think sometimes, well, he, he wasn't a great anchor of the faith. Look at him later on in John where, where he's talking about sending his disciples unto Jesus. Are you really the Christ or should we look for another... You know what? Jesus praised this man. He says he was the greatest born among women. We, we don't, don't go looking for excuses and for loopholes and these things. John wasn't a man who went back on his word. John wasn't a man who, who changed his mind like so many of us. We, we get fickle. Or we, we look for... Uh, hear some new doctrine or some new thing and, and we want to pay attention to this and pay attention to that. No, John sticks straight to the course. That's what a, an anchor is. Whether it's an anchor in the wall or an anchor for a boat that, that holds steadfast and sure and doesn't move, that's John. He said, I testify to the very fact that he was the Christ. He's the one that we're to believe on. He's the, he's the one that has the offer of eternal life. And that's the only way that you get in heaven. I haven't changed my mind about it. John was a bold man. I think of the fact that he pointed his finger into the wrong, into the face of the wrong man. Well, not really. He accused uh, the, the King Philip of taking a wife that shouldn't have been his, and he took his head off. There was a man by the name of Hugh Latimer, who was a reformer there in England. He was known as a great preacher of his day, and. As a result, he had many opportunities to speak, and he found himself one day that he was, they announced that he's going to speak before King Henry VIII. Now, can you imagine preaching to a king? And King Henry VIII, he, he's, he's known, you know, Henry VIII, I am, I am. You know, he got married to the widow next door. He's been married how many times before? This is the man he's preaching to. <laughs> he goes, but he says, Make sure you don't offend the king. Don't, 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 whatever you do, don't offend the king. That's the request. And as he begins his sermon preparation, he begins, he's walking and says, Latimer, Latimer, do you remember that you're speaking before the high and mighty King Henry VIII who has power to command you to be sent to prison and who can have your head cut off if it pleased him? Will you take care not to say nothing that will offend his royal ears? And then he paused and he began to rethink the whole thing. Latimer, Latimer, do you not remember that you're speaking before the King of King and Lord of Lords? Before him at whose throne King Henry VIII will stand? Before him who one day will, you will have to give an account of yourself? Latimer, Latimer, be faithful to your master and declare all of God's word. He chose the latter choice. And he would later lose his life by King Henry's uh, daughter, Mary. And he would lose his life to her. That's the thing. I mean, we can't be in it for just when things are good. John never changed his mind about what he believed. John never changed his mind about who he was in Christ. And I think to myself at the conclusion of everything here, as we, we've just talked about in the conclusion of, of all of his character, and I begin to, to wind it down, what made John the Baptist great? I think it's just as you put together a model car, or just as you would put together a puzzle. You take a look at that picture, and you keep 
building upon the picture and building upon the picture. And you keep that one picture as your focus. I believe John the Baptist, throughout every trait that he possessed, kept Christ as his focus. That, that's the challenge. Have you kept Christ your focus? Because without keeping Christ your focus, you're never going to have a joyful spirit all the time. I, I, t- I told somebody this morning, I said, I love it when I come in through the door and I see Elijah, he just bounces and bounces and he comes crawling unto me just full of joy and he's just excited to see me. That's how it is. That's how we're supposed to be with Christ. We need to keep Him our focus. We need to keep Him our joy. We need to keep Him uh, our peace. Keep Him our love of our life. Keep Him our everything. Or else there's going to be conflict along the way. Or else your tires are going to fall off. Or else the wheels, or else the door is going to fall off. I believe John would say, tell you his life was fulfilling. But I think to myself, is my life fulfilling? Is my life fulfilling? When, when I get to the end of my life, is it, is it fulfilling? If it's not, it's because of my character has been wrong. It's because of, I've lived for self instead of living for Christ. We need, if we want to have a fulfilling life, to keep Christ a sinner. Character has a lot to do with what's on the inside. And that's why it's so important. You, let me just put it to you this way. You guys are looking for good Christmas presents under the tree. Nobody likes Scrooge, right? Nobody wants it. Bah, humbug. Tired of Christmas. Don't, don't have any Christmas spirit in me. You can either be a Scrooge all your Christian life, or you can be a man like John the Baptist. I think if I had any present that, that, that would ever grace my soul, I would rather have the spirit of John the Baptist lived out in my life. Well, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love You. Lord, we're grateful for this man who's an example unto us. And Lord, we know that we, we're not perfect by any far stretch of the imagination. But I just ask You to do a work here within my heart and within the heart of this congregation. Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And every head bowed and every eye closed. Let me ask You. You say... Preacher, you you talked a lot about John the Baptist and how he was full of love and how he was full of joy and peace. His life was fulfilling, but I don't have that. I've lacked some of this character, and God has shown me that there are some rough edges that i got to get sanded out. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Amen. I see the hand. And Christ knows us better than we know ourselves. And He's able to help you to sand out those rough edges. And He's able to restore unto us the joy of our salvation. He's able to restore unto us uh, our, our fulfillment in life and give us purpose. And He just asks you to do business with God there. And last but not least, I always want to mention... There might be somebody here who doesn't know Christ. I don't know. Somebody here who's never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you say, I don't know this, this, this Savior. I don't know the one who's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. If that's you, would you slip up your hand? Christ will receive you. Christ will receive you. Amen. All right, if you would, look this way and stand to your feet. We want to sing Amazing Grace. We're a short hymn of invitation.
This message was an encouragement to your soul. Uh, Brother Sheely, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Well,